Hi, I'm Marsha Ball, and I'm excited to tell you about some new techniques for zero knowledge um, that were developed with Donna Dr. Soled and Kul Kulkarni. So to begin, uh, just a brief reminder about uh, what a zero knowledge proof is. So we have a prover and a verifier, and the prover is trying to convince the efficient verifier that uh, this statement is true, x is an L. Um, and so they interact and we only need three properties. We need completeness. If the statement is true, then the verifier accepts with high probability. We need the soundness. So if the statement is not true, then the verifier will reject uh, with high probability. And this should hold even if the prover is not behaving as uh, specified, behaving in fact ar completely arbitrarily. Um, and we want zero knowledge. So the zero knowledge says roughly that uh, the verifier only learns the truth of the statement from interacting with the prover and nothing else. Um, and this is captured by this uh, simulation paradigm. So right, it's, it says that uh, the right, zero knowledge holds if there exists a simulator, an efficient uh, procedure for generating a uh, transcript which is indistinguishable from the the real one when the prover and the verifier seem to interacting with this truly magical prover. Uh, so since your knowledge is introduction, we now know a fair amount about uh, sort of the complexity. So if one-way functions exist, we have zero knowledge proofs for all of NP. If they don't, uh, basically we only have zero knowledge proofs for languages that are trivial on average. Um, and the culmination of this is this work by Ong Vaden that says that uh, we have zero knowledge for a language even only if the language admits instance dependent commitments. Um, in this work, we're interested in understanding sort of minimal assumptions for zero knowledge, but in particular, we're interested in situations with uh, very limited interaction and trust actually. Um, so, but non-interactive zero knowledge is a sort of uh, a set a, a zero knowledge proof with as little interaction as possible. Um, so, in this setting, right, the prover is just going to send a single message to the verifier. The verifier isn't going to speak at all. Uh, this isn't achievable in the standalone model. So, uh, what's typically done is the prover and verifier are given access to some public randomness. So there's two settings that are typically considered. One is the what we would call the common random stream model or CRS model, where the randomness in the sky can be correlated, need not be uniform bits. And the other model considered typically in the literature is uh, this uniform random stream model or URS model where the bits are uniform. And this is better typically understood to be sort of a situation requiring less trust, whereas the correlations in the CRS model might require uh, using develop, might need to be generated using an MPC or something like this. Anyways, that's sort of outside the scope of this work. Um, what do we know about these two models? Uh, one way From one-way functions, we can construct uh, MISIC with CRS for NP. This can be extended actually to AM. And for in the uniform random string model, we know how to construct NISICs for NP from one-way permutations. This can also be extended. We are also interested in sort of um, relaxations of zero knowledge with limited interaction. So one such notion uh, that has found many applications is this uh, beautiful idea from Fork and Noir called a ZAP. So in a ZAP, we have a prover and a verifier, and a ZAP follows a very specific format. So it's a public coin protocol, and so the verifier sends, uh, start, begins by sending a uniformly random message, and the prover responds, and that's the end of the interaction. And the, the difference between what I was describing earlier is that this, uh, the promise here is uh, weaker than the one of zero knowledge. We just require witness indistinguishability. So what is witness indistinguishability? Uh, what we want is that for any two witnesses, W1, W2, if I run the prover with W1 and uh, let them interact with uh, any efficient verifier, there was, the transcript should be indistinguishable from if I uh, ran the protocol where the prover had uh, witness two. 
So one thing to note is that if the language has unique witnesses, uh, then this uh, property is trivially satisfiable. I can just the prover can just send the witness, um, and it will be indistinguishable. And uh, secondly, if the prover if we don't uh, constrain the prover at all, uh, then the prover can just find say the lexicographically first witness for any statement for any uh, x and just send that. Um, yeah. So what did Dworkinor show about this uh, notion of a zap? They showed that it was equivalent to uh, music in the uniform random string model. Um, and you may look at this line and you say, why, why do you have music is implied by trapdoor permutation? Didn't you just show it just, uh, holds from a comparatively weak assumption of one-way permutation? And the reason for that is that this transformation critically only applies if the prover is efficient. And the transformation I showed you uh, that was on the previous slide, the prover is inverting a one-way permutation. And so this, this construction from uh, Fege, Lapido, and Shamir is inherently inefficient. So what we are interested in this work is, can we show a similar transformation from Mizik to Zap with an inefficient prover? And that is indeed what we do. And so as a consequence, we get Zaps from one-way permutations uh, with uh, inefficient provers, um, but still non-trivial. And we have a variety of applications uh, or uh, sort of zero-knowledge type uh, proofs where it's very limited action interaction, non-interactive witness indistinguishability, one message zero-knowledge, and a new notion of what we call fine-grained zero-knowledge. And I'll say more about that uh, at the end of this talk. For now, I just want to focus on this uh, arrow across the middle, this transformation from Nizik to Zap. Um, and in particular, what I'd like to show is this theorem. So what does this say? So right, if a language L has a NISIC in the uniform random string model and a T time prover, then the language has a zap with a poly n times T prover. Right, there's a corollary. Uh, this, from this immediately we get uh, using this Lapido, uh, Lapido Shamir uh, protocol, we get zaps with uh, sub exponential time provers for NP. Um, so, right, we want to show this main theorem at the top. Uh, let's recall how Dworkinor showed the transformation for efficient provers. So we start with the NISIC, P and V are going to denote the verifier, the prover and verifier respectively, and we want to construct a zap. Right, the first message needs to be random, so we'll do just that. We'll, the verifier will sample some random strings and send them over to the prover. The prover will sample a random string of his own, S, then he will XOR S with uh, each RI to generate a series of URSs. And with respect to each URS, he's going to generate a proof. He will send this back to the verifier. And she will accept if uh, the NISIC verifier accepts all of the proofs after reconstructing the URSs, of course. So as you, you can see, like, right, the first message is uh, uniform, so it satisfies public coin. The URS, because we were XORing random stuff with a random string, is going to be uh, uniform for each proof. So, right, it should be fairly obvious by inspection that completeness holds based on the completeness of the NISIC proof. Soundness. Uh, to see soundness, we're going to fix some uh, X that's not in the language that we care about. And we're going to invoke the statistical soundness of the NISIC to argue that there are very few bad uniform random strings. And this bad, uh, uniform random string is bad if uh, there exists a pi which makes the verifier accept. Uh, and right, so next we will observe that for any fixed s over the randomness of r, the ris. Uh, the probability that all of these uniformly random URSs are bad is uh, can be bounded by something that's exponential in M. And next, uh, by simply taking a union bound over all of the S's, uh, we can bound the probability that there exists any sort of S 
that uh, would allow the prover to uh, trick the verifier. And, um, and we can bound this with 2 to the minus m plus n. So as long as m is greater than n, we're good. And we have statistical soundness. The final property we need is witness and distinguishability. Um, and I guess before I continue, there's nothing about these prior proofs, uh, completeness or soundness, uh, that required, uh, that said anything that sort of would differ if the prover was inefficient. So uh, the problem is going to come up here in the witness and distinguishability. So the witness and distinguishability is going to be proven near using a hybrid argument. So we want to switch these proofs, pi 1 through pi m, one by one, uh, from being generated using a witness 1 to a witness 2. And so in the ice hybrid, what we'll have is we'll have already switched uh, over the first i minus 1 proofs uh, to witness 2, and we'll try to switch over the ice proof. Um, the way that we're going to do this is we're going to reduce to the zero knowledge property of the uh, um, NISIC proof system, uh, right? We're going to by we're going to swap this proof, this ice proof, for a simulated proof, right? And this will this will reduce to the, the zero knowledge property. Uh, the reduction will simply generate all of these surrounding proofs, run the the distinguisher uh, uh, to break the underlying uh, NISIC uh, zero knowledge property, um, and the argument for indistinguishability to go to move to, to from the simulated proof to uh, proof generated using witness two is is identical. Okay, so the one thing to note here though is because soundness is uh, statistical, if we want uh, uh, zaps for NP, we want this transformation to hold for NP, and we don't want to cause some sort of collapse, it's sort of critical that this indistinguishability argument uh, is uh, computational. So this reduction, if we're going to follow some sort of reduction framework, it's like very important that this reduction is, uh, is efficient. Um, and the problem with applying this to uh, an inefficient prover <laughs> is that generating these surrounding proofs to feed to the reduction is simply too expensive because the prover, we don't have time to sample the, the proofs ourselves. Okay, so how can we get around this? So one thing, the first thing to sort of think about might be to sort of hard code uh, these, sample these proofs in sort of some pre-processing phase and hard code them into uh, distinguisher, into our uh, sort of distinguisher for the hybrids. So um, given that this is the first attempt, what goes wrong? What goes wrong here? So let's look at our, the reduction from Dwarf to Dwarf. So, right, so sort of the first step, we're gonna sort of invoke the, the distinguish verifier, distinguisher, whatever, to get these R1 through Rn. You can think of this as sort of a worst case choice. And the, then we're going to set in the, for the prover, we're going to set S to be uh, RI XORD with URS. So URS is the, is the uniform random string given to us by this uh, NISIC uh, zero knowledge game, security game. Next, we're going to set the jth URS to be uh, S XORD with RJ. And finally, we're going to generate these uh, proofs. All right. So what is the, what is the issue here uh, if we, if we hard-coded uh, these, if we wanted to hard-code these proofs to begin with? The thing is, uh, Right, the these the way that we sample these URSs it depends very critically on the URS that we're given from the security game. So we don't uh, know ahead of time uh, how to choose them, and right, so the sort of issue here is that they're they're potentially uh, or if, as soon as you fix this RI, they are very very correlated. 
Um, so how can we get around this? Uh, well, we dig up an old idea for sort of breaking these uh, sort of correlations. Um, the 80s. So Nissan and Richardson um, encountered a similar problem while trying to build uh, pseudo random generators. And the way they solved it was using combinatorial designs. So, what is this thing? So, you have these m subsets of integers from 1 to l, uh, such that each subset is of a fixed size n. And uh, for any two distinct subsets, their intersection is very small. So think of C as three for, for, our, for our purposes. So, <clears throat> right, as you see in this picture, right, we have two subsets that are large and they have very, very small intersection. Um, and they showed that uh, constructions of these objects for um, yeah, basically any C where L is order N squared. Um, and the way to, if you want to hint as to how to do this, uh, consider uh, low degree polynomials at the bottom of the slide. Uh, so how do we use this uh, design, Nissan Vigderson design? So uh, let's recall our construction from before. So we're going to use these designs to to break the correlations on the URS. So we're going to, instead of using S directly to generate the ith uh, uniform random string, we're going to sample the bits corresponding to TI, the ith set in this uh, design. So you get, uh, so S is going to be slightly longer than before, and we're going to take some of the bits and XOR this with the ith random string that the verifier sent us. And everything else will proceed identically. And the point being here, so now if we look at the URS J versus URS I, there's very little dependence between them. Uh, if all of, like, say you fix R, R I and R J, right, and all the freedom we have is over S, then there's like only a few, a uh, few bits in common. So uh, three if C is three. So completeness is preserved um, if we do this. And critically, soundness doesn't change by a lot. So the S is slightly longer, so we have a slightly larger uh, union bound. Um, but as long as uh, C is, uh, you know, say three, then uh, you get uh, that something uh, that's uh, you can bound this with something exponential in N. Okay, so. Uh, right, so let's check witness indistinguishability. So at a high level, what we're going to want, what we're doing is our reduction is going to end up being ultimately a uh, distribution over circuits, but we'll sort of view the sampling this distribution uh, as a pre-processing step for the sake of clarity. So the, the, so what we're going to do is we're going to get our R1 through RM from the distinguisher. We're going to sample uh, our s, all the bits of s that aren't, that don't correspond to the ith subset from the design. Okay, we're going to sample those uniformly, and we're going to, for each j not equal to i, and every setting of the bits that we didn't already set. So right, all the, the bits in an i t i, uh, we're going to. So for each Right, this is going to give us essentially, right, there's the most C of these bits, so we have uh, at most two to the C settings of them. And so for each of these uniform random strings, we're going to sample a proof for the statement. Okay. And we're going to hard code this whole thing as a lookup table into our reduction. So, right, the lookup table is of size two to the C. Um, so the reduction is not significantly bigger if C is a constant. Okay, so now uh, what do we do online? So right on input uh, pi urs from this NISIC security game, we simply uh, set uh, the ice uh, si the 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 ice uh, urs uh, as as before, uh, but using this design, and to evaluate all of the lookup tables to get the correct uh, the proofs that are correctly uh, distributed. And finally, we continue running the rest of the distinguisher. 
and that completes the proof. So, right, this is what we saw. We saw this transformation, uh, the simple transformation using this old idea from uh, de-randomization. And it sort of gives us a tight way of preserving uh, running time, prover running time in uh, uh, this uh, related transformation to that of Dwork and Or. And this immediately gives us this one-way permutations from uh, zaps from one-way permutations. So it may be though that maybe you find that this idea of agreeing prover and verifier agreeing on a uniform random string is already like too much to assume. So can we get away without any setup? So uh, if we want zero knowledge, we know that this is not possible. But there are sort of relaxations for which you don't need uh, public randomness and sort of which whereas you can which are achievable in the plane model. So one relaxation is one message zero knowledge from Barack and Paz. So here, right, you the prover sends a message, the verifier doesn't speak, and there's no um, uh, public randomness. But so instead of achieving uh, a soundness uh, against arbitrary cheating prover strategies, instead we just guarantee uniform soundness. So what this says is that if the statement isn't true, then the verifier will reject when interacting with any uniform sub-exponential time uh, prover. Um, and another relaxation is non-interactive witness indistinguishability or NIWI. So here it's just witness indistinguishability uh, it's exactly like the zap, except now the verifier doesn't send a message uh, to begin with. Um, and this is due to Barack Ong Fada. And so two sort of uh, applications of our technique by sort of modifying uh, Barack Ong Fada's uh, framework, uh, tweaking it a little bit to hold for this our setting, um, we get uh, from one-way permutations and hitting set generators for co-non-deterministic circuits. Um, I'm not going to describe what those are here, but you can look at our paper for details. We get NIWI for NP with sub-exponential time provers. And similarly, if we also add to this uh, sub-exponentially secure uniform collision-resistant hash functions, we get one message, uh, MISIX, where the simulator is efficient after a pre-processing step, which uh, so after the preprocessing is independent of the statement, um, but it's not in sort of a standard setting. Okay, but briefly, I'd like to tell you in the one minute remaining about this notion of fine-grained zero knowledge and our results there. So in the classic formalization of uh, the verifier learning nothing, right? If you have it, start with any PPT verifier, then the transcript. Uh, generated by the prover interacting with this verifier should be simulatable in poly time. So in, for our notion of fine-grained uh, zero knowledge, right, we're just going to replace any current of PPT with some complexity class C. So if uh, C complexity C verifier should be simulatable in time in, in this complexity class C, and, and simulatable means that the transcript is indistinguishable to C algorithm procedures in C. And uh, we extend this also to witness indistinguishability. And as a running example, what we are considering is C equal to NC1, or log depth circuits over a standard basis. And we allow them to be randomized. And results here we get using this, uh, from this worst case assumption, of uh, parity L slash poly not, contain, uh, not contained in NC1, we get uh, NC1 fine-grained physics in this sense that I described earlier uh, in the uniform random string model for NP, uh, zaps for NP in this for in this NC1 fine-grained sense as well. If we add hitting set generators for codon deterministic circuits, we get uh, fine-grained non-interactive witness and distinguishability. And finally, if we also add uniform collision resistant hash functions, we get one message uh, NC1 fine grained music for NP. All right, the key thing here is that uh, inefficient relative to NC1 uh, is different from inefficient relative to PPT. So all of our provers are actually polytime, uh, they're just not as efficient as uh, the verifiers. Um, and that's all. Thank you.